I also manage communications, run our monthly webinars, and I've been working quite a bit on food safety for small farmers. I have a bit of an odd background. I was a programmer of a Navy simulator and a database back dot com website. I was a high school physics teacher for seven years, a photographer, and a farmstead cheesemaker, but it all comes together in my current work. Jim? Hey, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm not sure if I have such a varied background, but it's, I guess it's almost as much. But um, uh, glad to be with you all today. As Josh said, my name is Jim Barham. I'm an agricultural economist at USDA's Rural Development Agency. Um, I've been with USDA for about eight years. Seven of those years uh, was with another agency called the Agricultural Marketing Service um, Agency of USDA and recently moved over to rural development last year. Uh, even with the move, most if not all of my work is focused on how to support local regional food system development. Uh, within that space, I have been focused quite a bit for the last five or six years on local food distribution and specifically on food hubs. So it's uh, Jeff and I have, uh, in the Wallace Center and USDA, have been uh, long collaborators in, in, on food hubs and other pieces of the food system. And we'll get a lot more into both our organizations in a second. So Jeff, you want to back to you? Yeah, sure. Um, Okay, uh, so just a, a quick overview of uh, what we will talk about today. So we we started with a bit of uh, who we are, and in a moment, as Jim said, we'll talk about our, our organizations. And we'll talk uh, about what exactly we mean when we say a food hub. We'll, we'll give you the definition and then go a bit beyond the definition to give you some good context and what a food hub really is. We'll dig into some of the details about what it takes to be a viable hub uh, in our research and also in our uh, modeling. Uh, we were asked to go a bit deeper in the idea of food hubs as processors, so uh, we'll add a bit uh, uh, on hubs working closely uh, with, as processors and working closely with processors. And finally, we'll give you a, a whole bundle of resources that we and others have uh, to move you towards making the right decisions for your situation, uh, from things to read to communities to join. So let me talk about the Wallace Center. Um, I work for the Wallace Center at Winrock International. We are a nonprofit funded primarily by philanthropies who want to create, uh, to, sorry, who want to increase the prevalence of food that is healthier for people, more environmentally sound, and more beneficial to local economies. We also re receive funding from the government uh, and from corporate social responsibility interests from businesses. We have a market-based approach to helping others to realize this vision of a 21st century food system, meaning that although we ourselves rely on grant support to stimulate and guide change, we feel that the way to really move the needle in getting more good food to people requires solid business businesses to execute on a triple bottom line vision. We have several interconnected ways that we provide support. Technical assistance, such as this webinar and our upcoming National Food Hub Conference. Knowledge sharing, such as on our foodhub.info website. We look for and support emerging models and uh, means for success, such as our work in Group Gap, a collective means for lower resource farmers to attain third party food, cert food safety certification. We connect people to the right people, knowledge, and funding as possible, and we connect people uh, to their peers through our learning networks we call communities of practice. The National Good Food Network brings together people from all sectors looking to scale up good food. It's Food Hub Collaboration, coordinated by the Wallace Center uh, uh, with USDA as an important member, is truly the leader in supporting food hubs across the country. In fact, for, mo for most people, if you Google Food Hub, our definition pops up right at the top there, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, I'll tell you uh, a bit more about some of the resources we have to offer later, but uh, let me hand the mic back over to Jim to tell you about um, the Know Your Farmer initiative. Thanks, Jeff. Um, let me go to the next slide here. So I'm going to focus, obviously, I, I can't spend uh, too much time talking uh, about USDA writ large. Uh, it's 26 agencies, and we do a lot of stuff. 
but what I do want to talk uh, briefly about is Know Your Farm and Know Your Food Initiative, which at this point hopefully you have heard of. If you haven't, uh, it really is the one-stop shop for all things local regional food systems at USDA. It's an initiative that's been around since 2009, and the purpose of it is to um, really coordinate efforts within our different agencies. Like you said, we, like I said, we have quite a few different agencies, and to make sure that we actually are talking to each other and understanding what opportunities exist for a cross collaboration within agencies as well as with our other federal partners. And then finally, uh, Know Your Farm, Know Your Food is also about outreach and engagement with consumers across the United States to have them understand the benefits of being part of a local regional food system. So uh, I sit on the management team of Know Your Farm, Know Your Food. We help set the priorities and the policies for USDA around this particular area. It is a incredibly important one for Secretary Vilsack. It's part of what he calls the four, one of the four pillars of revitalizing our rural economies. So he takes it very seriously, and we've been it's been great to work under this administration that has taken such a strong interest in this area. So I'll, at the end, we'll go into more of the resources uh, connected with Know Your Farmer. But I think it's always important in any presentation, uh, even though I think we, we're probably talking to a fairly sophisticated audience, uh, to at least from a USDA perspective of what do we mean by a local and regional food system. And to break it down, what we're talking about are all phases of life cycle of food, that, that entire supply chain from the production to ultimately to the consumption and even the waste and the reuse and, re and uh, recycling of those products. That whole system uh, is taking place within a specific region. And within that region, there are specific benefits, economic, social, environmental, that accrue to that local community. The idea is these products are being marketed as local, so consumers can really choose to support local businesses with their purchase. We at USDA do not have a one-all definition for local food. We have a few based on some legislative authorities. But generally speaking, the idea of local food and defining local food is really up to the community. Within the food system space and what we're going to be talking about today are regional food hubs. Um, you know, at, at the bottom line of food hubs, we're talking about some core functions that a, a business organization is doing, and those include aggregation, distribution, and marketing of those local food from farmers, ultimately, to consumers. We have our definition, which was crafted along with the Wallace Center and our other partners. Uh, it has kind of has become kind of our official definition, uh, first posed in a, a, a joint publication between us and the Wallace Center and the Regional Food Hub Resource Guide. And you can basically read it here. It's this idea of a business organization. Again, it doesn't really matter if it, we're not talking that it has to be a for-profit or non-profit or cooperative. That's less important as the function that they ultimately, uh, that they're actually ultimately doing, which is actively managing that aggregation distribution and marketing of and here's a key piece, source identified food products, that you actually know where your food is coming from and from whom, and that those products are primarily come from local regional producers who are, are, are basically linking into and satisfying that wholesale retail and institutional market demand. Food hubs are more than just um, a distributor. As my, many people ask me, you know, how do we actually dis distinguish or differentiate a food hub from a, a food distributor? Well, they certainly do those functions, but beyond that, they're offering a suite of other services, often to producers as well as consumers, to the community at large, that really create what we would call a triple bottom line business or aspiring to be a triple line business. So on the left side of this diagram, you're looking at a number of the type of producer services that, that food hubs typically uh, become involved in or can be involved in. Then you have the kind of core operational services, and then on the right-hand side, more of the community engagement piece of this. Just to, and I, I know this is kind of one of those overwhelming too many letters and too many words and too many sentences and too much of everything on one particular side, but just use it as a reference and it really helps to clarify much of what we mean by food hubs, some of those defining characteristics. And I would focus on one piece here, and this really is the last check mark, and the idea that food hubs aim to be financially viable while also having other positive economic, social, and envir environmental impacts within their communities. And I focus on that because Food hubs are really at the heart of what we call food value chains. Food value chains are very different from your typical supply chain. The typical supply chain, we're looking at 
the outside functions here that you see. You see you have the farmers and ranchers up top, the production side, then you have the aggregators and processors. Then you continue to go down the circle of distributors that are getting the food to the restaurants, food service, so forth, the consumers. Those activities, as we know, happen with any supply chain, whether it's the most local or the most international. What differentiates a supply chain from a food value chain is really what's inside the circle. And it says this belief in this set of systems of mission values and operational values that everyone in the supply chain are trying to achieve. So when we talk about value chains, we're talking about how a set of businesses, strategic reliance, alliance between businesses, are there to try to create and produce both financial success as well as social benefits within that supply chain. So we're looking at a set of shared mission values that that particular supply chain may uh, adhere to. Maybe they're really focused on uh, farmland preservation and sustainable production practices. And then they're also maybe focused on, well, they would all be focused on with the value chain, all of these operational values of accountability, long-term commitment, transparency, and ongoing communication within the value chains. I, I embed or I embed food hubs within the value chains because it's really it's the almost the quintessential business that's helping to link a lot of these pieces together within value chains. And I want to at least socialize this idea of value chains with you today um, as we continue to talk about kind of food hubs in the future and the role they play within our food system. So how do we classify food hubs? So it's interesting that Josh brought up that your next um, presentation or uh, series, uh, set in, um, uh, the next seminar in this series of food hubs is going to deal with actually the legal structure, which is great. There's a lot of advantages and disadvantages, of whether you're uh, structured as a nonprofit or a for-profit or a cooperative. Um, but when it comes to classifying food hubs in terms of what, what's really meaningful in terms of why food hubs succeed or fail, uh, it really doesn't have much to do with their legal structure, believe it or not. And we, we have quite a bit of data to back this up now. Um, food hub success and failure has a lot more to do with their function than their form. Um, so when we start thinking about what we want to analyze food hubs, we can certainly analyze them by their legal structure, but we find that there's a lot more value in actually classifying and analyzing food hubs by the markets they serve. Because if you're a wholesale versus a direct consumer or you're doing a little bit of both, that, that, that has direct um, influence and consequence in terms of how you structure your food hub, the types of uh, infrastructure you need in place, the types of labor you need in place. So in any case, I'll get into more of that in a second, but uh, just to explain a little difference between these different food hub types, we have the wholesale food hub model, which means there's a food hub who's selling exclusively wholesale accounts to, say, restaurants, grocery stores. It could be to schools, hospitals, other institutional markets. And then you have, on the other side, the direct consumer food hubs, food hubs that are selling. They're still an intermediary, okay, but they are selling those products to consumers. They're just managing that, that supply flow. Uh, good examples of this would be online farmer's markets, in which you have, you know, it could be 10, 15, 20, even 100 different farmers putting their products up on site. You have a manager, the food hub, who's actually managing those transactions and then managing the logistics of moving that food to either you know designated drop-off spots pick up at workplace or at home and you know other examples would be multi-farm csas even mobile markets and those types and then of course we have food hubs and you can see here it breaks down almost in a 30 30 30 a little, little a few more direct consumer a few less wholesale but a, a good good number or hybrid which is they just do both they they sell into uh, a very common model would be a multi-farm CSA that also sells into some restaurants, um, has a few wholesale accounts there. Uh, they have specialty products, and they can service that. But then, you know, you, you have every variation possible to man and woman is, is, is possible here with these different types. But this at least allows you to break it down into some, some general categories. I'm not going to focus all on We could spend the whole... Um, presentation talking about food hub best practices and there's a lot out there and there's a growing number of things that we're learning about what works and what doesn't work with food hubs and you know it's always within a certain context in some cases what seems to work for some food hubs doesn't work for others but generally speaking I've listed here about 10 uh, keys to successful marketing for food hubs that seem to hold across the board um, things like product differentiation and making sure that you're not selling, you know, a commodity that's, that has no value uh, to the consumers beyond, you know, it's just an apple for an apple. Well, you're not just selling apples. You're selling a particular story 
a particular variety of Apatow that is compelling to um, a segment of consumers. And so these are the types of things we're looking at. Um, so there's some here, and then, you know, I get a little cheeky with this second set of, 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 of keys to success or best practices, such as, you know, obviously it's not a good idea to poison your customers. You know, they, they don't tend to like that. But it gets into this idea that, you know, when you're thinking of your business and how you're going to ultimately structure your business, how you're going to run your business, there's just certain things that you have to keep in mind, like safe food safety and making sure when you're setting up your food hub business that food safety isn't an afterthought, that you've already set up a system that is going to adequately address um, both uh, mitigate any risk of foodborne illness as well as have a, a, a robust traceability system if something seems to go wrong so you can recall products. All that kind of stuff, it just has to be built in inherently and at the beginning and integral to your business. And then there are things like this one, and again, it's kind of cheeky, never forget supply, supply, supply. And without ensuring a consistent, reliable supply of quality products, you have no business running food hub and you will have no business. Well. It, it's uh, it's shocking, actually, to the number of food hubs I've talked to who have, who haven't really fully uh, come to terms with what their supply is going to be. Um, sometimes you have food hubs that set up and say, "Well, you know, I I really only want to source 50 miles away from from where we are." Well, that's all well and good, and that may serve you for two months of the year. But what does that mean for the rest of the year? And will you be able to? Uh, retain kind of a consistent supply um, in the years that you may not be able to pull products from that very small um, supply area. So anyway, it's it's a lot of things like that. Some are pretty common sense, but tend to be forgotten at different points in time as you structure your business. And the one I want to focus on the most is what I call the oxygen mask rule of food hub viability. Uh, we spoke earlier about this idea of food hubs as part of food value chains, as part of businesses that are looking to be both financially successful, but also um, develop and, and accrue a number of social, economic, and, and other environmental benefits to the community. And that's all well and good to be, to aspire to be a triple bottom line business and to, and to want to have all these other uh, social benefits. But if you can't secure your own oxygen, and that's your margin, to actually run a successful business, then the rest of it, the mission, um, will no longer matter. Uh, so it's about securing your oxygen first, getting yourself on financial sound footing before uh, really um, diving too deeply into some of the other social benefits. And again, a lot of these are intermingled and intertwined, but sometimes you have to disentangle and say, what are kind of our core operational functions? What do we really need to be doing so that we can ultimately in the end serve our mission? So along those lines, we've worked uh, both with the Wallace Center and with folks like Jim Matson with Matson Consulting, who does a lot of work on food hubs, to kind of look at the viability of food hubs. Um, one of the questions that uh, the Wallace Center and Michigan State University asked in the last survey was about uh, food hub dependency on grant funding, because uh, you know a lot of people are concerned that uh, you know if this external funding is uh, goes away, will food hubs still be able to maintain their core functions? And interestingly enough. Uh, just about half said they're actually not dependent at all on food hub funding, which was a which was a very um, um, actually even somewhat surprising finding, but in the end a very hopeful finding in terms of food hubs being able to kind of maintain their core operations. And even the ones that said somewhat dependent, uh, as you know, is the the question is framed and the response to that question is given, it really is saying we're we can exist without any external funding and maintain our core operations of aggregation distribution distribution and marketing local food products. That means they wouldn't have the ability to provide a lot of the other services to producers and, consume, and consumers in the community at large, but still it does mean that a fair number, over 80% of food hubs that were surveyed and responded to the survey, uh, were on, on decent financial footing, which is great to see. We also know uh, from some modeling that we've done with Jim Matson and his group, and we actually uh, did a webinar at the Wallace Center that I encourage you to check out. Uh, that we call, I think it was called the million dollar question. And, and it was kind of, you know, in one way it's, a, it's about trying to um, provide some baseline of what it takes to have an operational break-in or even a viable food hub. It's a modeling exercise, so, uh, you know, you have to take all, all these types of numbers with a grain of salt. That being said, it gives you some kind of benchmark in a way. And what we know from um, that modeling based on real food hub data, so it's not just pulling this out of the air, is that, um, you know, to get kind of operational break-even, you're looking at around a million if you're in the wholesale um, 
just doing exclusively wholesale accounts. And to get the viability, which is when you actually are you're make you're a profitable and you can put you know money aside to ensure uh, you know have your rating day fund. And so if your truck breaks down, you you're fully equipped to finance another one, you know, and, and can deal with a lot of contingencies that you're in that kind of 2.4. And, you know, in, in my conversations with quite a few food hubs across the country, getting in that 2 to $3 million range, if you're a wholesale food hubs where, you know, is the sweet spot of where you want to be to really feel like you've got, you're on good firm, uh, firm foundation and can really grow your business. And, and if some calamity comes up that you're, you're, you're well positioned to handle it. On the other side, the direct consumer food hub doesn't uh, doesn't need uh, such a high. Uh, you don't need to generate such high revenues. A lot of it has to do with the smaller footprint of a facility, um, and you know it's a lot of um, just-in-time inventory, moving products in and out. Uh, you can rely uh, quite a bit more on the infrastructure that might be already available on farm, um, less storage capacity. Just there's a lot of reasons behind not needing that same kind of. Uh, um, high level of annual sales. And so for direct consumer, to kind of get to that really profitable, viable, you know, you're in about the half million dollar range. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a few scenario analysis, but if you want to go deeper into this, I recommend checking out that webinar if you haven't already. And let me just, let me just jump in, Jim. Sure. Uh, uh, direct to consumer, I think, also has a, tends to have a better, um, you know, unit mar margin. However, um, the, the market is, Almost always not uh, super big, um, so it's it's uh, uh, it, I have a tendency to see oh direct to consumer all I need to make is three hundred push three hundred thousand dollars and I'm I'm all set, uh, but but it's it's hard to find those uh, those buyers in in uh, some communities. Yeah, and it, the the another way of, of of really classifying these two models wholesale is. Is high volume, low margin, and direct consumer is low volume, high margin. Uh, and so trying to, to balance those two. And, in, and sometimes you can, you know, with the, a lot of food hubs, obviously over 30% are doing both of this because they've, they may have a pretty high volume in certain products, which allow them to move to the wholesale accounts. And then they might have low volume but really high specialty products that they know they can get a high margin by selling direct to consumer. So uh, one of the things we did was – provide some scenario analysis, and it all begins with the fact of some assumptions. Um, and one thing to keep in mind with any food hub is that the overwhelming majority, close to 70% of the revenue you generate is most likely to be going back to producers. So that gives you a very small sliver, say 30%, in which to deal with all the other costs, operating costs of running a food hub. And so it has a big impact when you start thinking about this particular business model, when you start thinking about what you give to producers, what you're giving in terms of to labor, other additional costs. And so this, I think, is really one of the most, you know, in the study that uh, Jim Matson did for us at USDA on the financial viability piece, is one of the most stunning ones, which is really uh, what you ultimately decide to pay to your producers. And if, you know, we, we use for the model a baseline of 70%, and just so you know, what the this scenario analysis here is based upon the wholesale model break-even, operational break-even, which is about 1.2 million, and you use a baseline of 70%. But if you just increase that and you say, you know what, we're, we're here to serve our producers, and that's, that, is, generally speaking, is the bottom line for food hubs across the country, we want to put more money in their pocket, um, which is what you want to do. But even if you raise 5% more and put 5% more, you, you know, you're looking at possibly needing another half a million before you're, you're getting to an operational break-even. Um, so it's, it's quite dramatic, you know, and, and if you do an 80-20 split, and I know of food hubs across this country in which they are doing 80-20 split, um, it really draws into question whether you're a wholesale, and this still holds true even for direct consumer to, to, to pretty much a similar degree. Uh, you know, you could, you're talking doubling, almost tripling what you need in terms of your overall annual sales um, to get to that operational break-even if you're putting that much more money in the pocket of producers. Uh, and this is a conundrum. This is one that, of course, within traditional distributors, there's a, there's a very good reason why um, a, lot of consumer, uh, a lot of producers complain that they're not getting a fair shake from the distributors. Well, there's a lot of costs associated with distributing. It's a pretty low-margin business uh, or tight-margin business. So that's just one of those things to kind of really keep in mind and be thinking about from the very beginning of starting a food hub. Like, what can we realistically pay our producers that is obviously going to 
make sure they're getting a fair price for their products, yet at the same time ensures that we can run an operation and pay our expenses. Uh, additional labor costs, here's another piece of it. And so if we think of, of just simply um, 40,000, maybe a low for in some places for a full, uh, full-time full employee in FTE, but let's just take it as that as if you're adding one more employee. All of a sudden, if you have, again, starting your baseline of 1.2, because there's such a small sliver that actually goes toward operations, things get exacerbated quite quickly. Say you add a couple employees, you might be moving from a baseline of operational uh, breaking of 1.2, and then all of a sudden, you know, you need your up to 1.5, 1.6, almost, for, you know, 400,000 more. It's, it can be quite remarkable. So labor is the second largest cost that food hubs face, and thinking how to use that efficiently and effectively. And, and in many cases for food hubs at the beginning, it, it requires it's a lot of sweat equity and volunteers, and that can serve you at the beginning, but ultimately over time, you want to build up that institutional knowledge and that professionalism and, you know, hire staff um, who's going to get you into that more viable stage of development. Uh, but it, it is the largest uh, cost after, you know, um, payment to producers. And alternatively, and this is also quite remarkable looking at the model, what some external funding can do to help you really uh, uh, cover your operational costs. So, you know, a 1.2 million, again, at the baseline, if you were able to acquire 50,000 annually outside of your operating budget to, to, well, to offset some of your operating costs, it lowers remarkably your, your actually your operational break-even number. So if you get 50,000, you know, you can take it from 1.2 to almost less than a million dollars. Um, so one of the things that doesn't mean that we're advocating that you should be find external funding for the rest of your life because we know how precarious that can be, but it does make a good case for as a food hub is getting up and started and is looking to be, you know, efficient, uh, lean business, at the same time, you know, an injection of some community capital uh, can go a long way to getting that food hub to be on firm footing sooner uh, than later. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn over to Jeff. We've been pretty conceptual this whole time. Uh, <laughs> so now we'll at least get some examples. And, um, and, and with the, uh, maybe slightly more focus on processing, but I'll let you take it from here, Jeff. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, th this, is, this is an example about um, uh, how ongoing support can really, uh, really change a, 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 whole, a whole state's food system, or, or it, at least it's on its way. Um, Cherry Capital Foods is a model hub in many ways. They're located in Traverse City, Michigan, uh, and they are a for-profit food hub. They have really diverse markets. They run the gamut from you know, white table cloth west restaurants, high, high margin white table cloth restaurants, to uh, school and other institutional food services which are, tend to be low, lower margin markets, uh, and plenty in between. Their growth is truly astounding. Pretty much a 50% growth each year they've been in operation, which means uh, adding $2 million in revenue over last year, at, so they, they are now on track for $6 million uh, once 2015 closes out. And if this keeps up, uh, and you know every indication is that it will, uh, that's $9 million of revenue for 2016. Tons of food, literally tons of food. Yet, and here's the point of me talking about Cherry Capital Foods here, they have still yet to make a profit. They have many employees, many trucks, 12 trucks currently, I think, uh, two warehouses. They recently changed the software they use to run the company. There are lots of expenses. Um, these, these guys are alive, truly thriving, really. Uh, because their owner has significant personal resources to support his long-term vision of really changing the Michigan food system in a fundamental way. They'll make a profit, significant profit, at some point, uh, and this hub has the resources to build a benevolent yet dominant com company in Michigan. It, that uh, that uh, patient investor is key, and I have up here the Amazon.com model, which is uh, you know, Amazon.com, tons and tons of revenue, and only recently uh, has just barely started to, to turn a profit, lots, lots and lots of uh, reinvestment into the, the company. 
Uh, I, I did want to emphasize that benevolent point. Um, they are committed to supporting Michigan farmers and eaters. In addition to sales for the farmers, they are at some expense building the foundation for a significant group gap program. And uh, if there are questions about that, I'm happy to talk about group gap. Um, they have uh, built a sophisticated share use, shared use facility for local value added food businesses who are in a, sort of a tweener stage, too big for a shared use kitchen, but too small for their own bricks and mortar. So they are really uh, ch changing the landscape and yet not making a profit. So uh, keep, keep it. Traverse City, uh, the, the Cherry Capital Foods is a good example of uh, a fund that, uh, uh, a hub that doesn't fit exactly the the 1.2 million or even 2.4 million dollar uh, model. Jim, you want to present this slide and I'll, I'll give a few more examples? Yes, I was on mute. Okay, um, so one of the other things, and this was, uh, you know, when we were talking to Josh, he was like, look, there, there seems to be a significant interest uh, by at least a segment of our stakeholders to really be thinking about processing, that there's there's opportunities there for local food processing. Um, you know, what, what, what hubs are doing this kind of thing? Um, Cherry Capital has kind of developed a shared use uh, capacity. And just from our, our uh, survey from last, last time, and by the way, the MSU and Wallace will be putting out, I believe, the, the new survey results sometime in November or so. So we'll have even more update data fairly soon. But based on that, you know, we're looking at very few food hubs actually really are, are that uh, involved in processing. And there are some reasons behind that we can get into a little bit later. But you can see kind of on the right-hand side, canning, cutting, uh, shared use kitchen, freezing, um, all below 20%. And, um, you know, the overall processing facilities is 23%. And that was a, a low response number. Uh, so, you know, 23% or 75, you know, we're talking about, you know, maybe 14 or so food hubs. And that, that's probably you know, actually kind of a high number. Uh, but we do know that, you know, over 40, sorry, over 50% of hubs are selling value-added products. And I know many, many hubs would love to get their hands on more value-added local products uh, because it helps them with uh, diversifying their, certainly their product portfolio and being able to offer products in off-season times when, you know, they may not have a lot of the fresh products available. So I'll stop there and you can go on. Sure. So uh, I want to give you four different approaches to processing that various hubs around the country have taken. I'm going to go pretty fast, but you know, ask me questions in the in the Q and A period. Um, and also, I want to note that in almost every case, I have a resource listed uh, for you to dig in way deeper as appropriate. And those resources are generally on the slides. So. Mad River Food Hub uh, is a for-profit hub uh, in North Central Vermont. It's a fully licensed fully licensed USDA inspected meat processing facility and indeed the only one in all of Vermont. And Vermont for reference is about a quarter the size of all of Indiana. Um, Mad River also has significant facilities for fruit and vegetable processing. The hub was started only after several years of planning with lots and lots of people uh, involved from private and public sectors to support the Mad River Valley, uh, which is filled with small scale but struggling agriculture. Uh, the facility really is a success. In a rather short time, uh, it has be become able to support itself with a few caveats. One is that grant money supported the build out of the facility that was already owned privately by the founder. Uh, Vermont allows something called a low profit limited liability company or an L3C, which allows a for profit to accept grant funding, such as in this example. Uh, moreover, all along, Mad, Mad River has been smart about grants and other financial supports to keep things in the black. And the founder did not take a salary for a good while. Again, uh, then we have a solid business that has some excellent and stable backing. Mad River is really best thought of as a business incubator. Folks rent the processing and storage areas, pay for distribution by the Mad River truck as well as some other close uh, partners who provide additional distribution. And there is significant entrepreneur training that is uh, available and in, uh, in, in fact required um, in, some, in some cases. Uh, Robin Morris, the founder of Mad River, has written the entire story in incredible detail, including, for instance, architectural drawings. He offers uh, this uh, probably about 80 page document for $30. So uh, write down this link uh, if you are interested uh, in replicating model uh, his model. Uh, there's, there's your manual right there. 
Okay, uh, Western Massachusetts Food Processing uh, Center uh, is, a, is a similar example. Uh, it's run by the Franklin County Community Development Corporation uh, in Western Massachusetts. They are first and foremost about business incubation. Uh, they are a nonprofit that has many different services they provide for area entrepreneurs of all types, not just food. But because they are in a very, very agricultural area, they invested in a shared use kitchen, which they have over the years built out significantly. In addition to renting the facility at low cost to Meals on Wheels, a charity that provides hot meals to homebound folks, they do hourly kitchen rental for folks who have, for instance, their own salsa they want to make uh, and bottle and then market. Uh, they also do white label business uh, where, say, a business gives them their hot fudge recipe uh, and uh, has them uh, cook and bottle it and then brand it with the ice cream store logo. Uh, finally, they do smallish scale processing of a few local products, chop and freeze, broccoli, cauliflower, and one or two other products. This last one is managed by the, the um, uh, Community Development Corporation itself and is really what makes them a food hub. They take bulk deliveries of product from local farmers and, and do their sales primarily to schools and institutions. They have moved from uh, uh, bulk freezing to IQF now. I have listed some challenges here as a not-for-profit. They are able to receive grants and have been very careful about the grants they apply for and accept. Slow, steady, careful is their MO, and they have been quite successful because of it, although not profitable if you subtract grants. Uh, common market uh, in Philadelphia is a wholesale nonprofit food hub, uh, and again, is a wonderful model in many, many ways. As suppliers uh, to many schools and hospitals, which is an excellent way to get good food to underserved populations, in a temperate, and they are in a temperate growing region in Philly, they started to investigate season extension through processing, primarily freezing. Through a grant from us, the Wallace Center, they were able to perform a comprehensive feasibility study, understanding demand first, then looking at the supply and infrastructure. Their assessment was that a full processing build out of their own was not possible, but they did find a local processor about 50 miles away from their distribution center who had similar values and were at an appropriate scale. They started with a pilot of something like, I think it was 29 pallets of spinach, which is not a little bit, uh, but not, not a lot in the, in the grand scheme of things either. The processor was able to provide the cold storage uh, as they sold their stock down. That, that space was rented by Common Market. Uh, this is a great example of leveraging existing resources to keep the focus of the hub on hubbing. Um, there is a link to lots and lots of details at our site. CM, for this short link here, CM Frozen is for Common Market Frozen Project. Um, so uh, dig in for more. Uh, finally, let me tell you about Headwater Foods, uh, another for-profit uh, food hub on upstate New York. Headwater started uh, with a strong, rapidly growing multi-farm consumer box program. Uh, and after building the supply, they started to enter the wholesale market. They also did a very large and detailed feasibility study, really quite wide ranging. Processing was only part of the study in this case. Uh, and there's a link to the study down at the, the bottom of the slide here. Uh, detailed and beautiful, as it, uh, as it turned out. Um, they did find that there were a handful of products uh, when they talked to their buyers that required processing that were in high demand. So with a careful thought towards efficiency, which absolutely needs to be the food hub mantra, Headwaters has a plan to use different partners for different products. And where there isn't a partner but strong buyer demand, they will be investing in their own processing. So four very different examples uh, and um, uh, and I'm sure uh, there's uh, the details for you to dig into uh, as as required. All right, awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so one last word on the processing, and it's interesting because I, here's a slide before we talk to Jeff that I had, which was just generally speaking, local food system challenges and opportunities. And there's three that have stood out for me this past year. Uh, clearly, one is food safety, as many of you may already know, uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. Is, is coming into effect. Uh, we already, the prevent, preventative controls just came out and the, the produce rules will be out soon. And as Jeff has mentioned several times, there's opportunities um, to, 
to uh, there's, there's certainly are challenges in order to come, come into compliance, but opportunities to, to access programs like GroupGap to ensure uh, that we don't all of a sudden get a major drop in the amount of local food supply out there. The other thing, of course, is what we're talking about in the local food infrastructure, and I say especially processing here, and it's been something that has, has popped up quite a bit this last year from a number of food hubs, thinking of, well, maybe, I, you know, we're exploring this opportunity to um, begin to actually process products. And, and using the, the headwater example is a good one in which, you know, they're saying, well, you know, we, we want to do some IQ, IQF, some, um, some quick freeze products, individual quick freeze, um, uh, but that's pretty pricey equipment. We know there's, there's a partner out there who does do that. Maybe we're, we're best off, and, and ultimately in the end, their study showed that they're best off not, you know, making that type of investment, but partnering with others who have that equipment and they can, can work together. Um, and then similarly, some fresh cut uh, chopped broccoli and, 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 and cauliflower and other, other things that another partner uh, has been doing and could do for them. But then, you know, they were looking at things like fresh salad grains and, and, and the high demand market for those of local fresh salad grains, but no one really having that, that maybe equipment's probably out there, but no one really willing to partner with them. And they're thinking, well, this might be where we might make our investment. So very selective in terms of their investment of in the processing space. And I will say overall that, boy, food hubs who have kind of penciled a lot of this out don't find a really viable option out there to be adding this additional service onto their business. Food hubs are at their core aggregators and distributors. Adding a processing element is um, precarious at best. It requires a lot of volume. It, the labor costs are high, the equipment costs are high. Um, so it's something that any food hub or any business who's thinking going to processing should really think long and hard and do the right analysis uh, before willy-nilly going into something like that. Um, so within the food system space, obviously these challenges exist, whether it's in the food safety or, or finding scale appropriate infrastructure or just uh, adequate consistent supply of local food. USDA is there to help uh, as well as the Wallace Center and we have a lot of resources available as some of you may already know that we have a lot of technical assistance resources, a lot of it we've done in partnership with the Wallace Center and others. Uh, all these can be found at our websites that you'll see here. And we'll share this slide deck, or Josh can sell this slide deck, because I'm going to move through our resources section fairly quickly because a lot of it, uh, you know, you can just look online to get those things. Food Value Change is another report that we put out with the Wallace Center that goes in a bit deeper of what I was talking about earlier um, about kind of the, the role the food, food value chains play within the food system. Um, one thing I want to highlight, and many of you probably already know this as well, is that um, coming over to rural development, I helped to start a new textbook report series on food hubs. The first two here listed, Lessons Learned from the Field and Business Operations Guide, are actually out. Uh, email me if you'd like a hard copy. And then the next one will be on financial viability. It's not out yet, probably sometime this winter. And it, it will talk about a lot of what we, I've mentioned today, the, the different kind of financial models of getting to operational break-even break and even viability. And then uh, there's another food hub uh, report that we'll be doing on why food hubs fail, which is my favorite report, um, not because I like to see food hubs fail, but you can learn a lot more from failure than you can from success. So we're looking forward to putting uh, that particular piece out on the street sometime this spring. Uh, and then uh, there is also some upcoming training opportunities. We've been doing this in partnership with Wholesome Wave. They developed this fantastic uh, Food Hub Business Assessment Toolkit, which is really, uh, it's essentially targeted for uh, investors and food systems funders who are looking to assess kind of the uh, Food Hub readiness for investment. Um, we've developed a, a companion online training um, course to, uh, to help people walk, walk, walk people through this toolkit. Uh, you'll see a lot more of that uh, coming in the future. Uh, Pulse and Wave will be hosting this training that you can download for free on their website. We're still working out some logistics, but it's upcoming and I'll, I'll keep you posted. Or at the very least, I'll keep Josh posted and he can get this out to you guys. Um, we have our own USDA Food Hub portal at, uh, that, an agricultural marketing service with a lot of good resources there. And then of course, uh, the Wallace Center uh, through the National Food Hub Collaboration has a fantastic uh, website as well, really cool webinars, and I'll have Jeff talk a little bit more about those resources. Sure, yeah, 
<laughs> foodhub.info is great. Uh, it's a hub-focused page on uh, within ngfn.org. Uh, and I did also want to point out uh, uh, the webinars. They are great to attend live. Um, and uh, th there is, uh, we are having one in two days uh, on uh, uh, working with hospitals uh, to fund good food work. Uh, and there actually is a sign-up link for the November webinar as well, uh, which is uh, the presentation of uh, this year's uh, uh, Food Hub survey uh, that Wallace Center does with uh, Michigan State University. So, uh, but we also have over 50 fantastic webinars that we have archived, uh, and uh, it's not quite the same, uh, but they are really uh, still excellent learning opportunities. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to talk about our uh, community of practice. Uh, the NGFN Food Hub collaboration has over 1,100 Food Hub managers, staff, and supporters uh, who are on a, a Google group, our community of practice. Uh, it really is the premier feature of our community. Uh, folks ask questions, uh, and others could be peers, could be consultants, uh, researchers, provide thoughtful answers. You do have to register, so the first link there is the FHCOP, bit.ly slash FHCOP. Uh, register, uh, uh, and then we will add you to the community within a few days. We have something we have to do on our end. But once, you're, once uh, you are added, uh, you can go to Food Hub Talk, bit.ly slash Food Hub Talk, uh, visit the archives of the community, and post your own questions, and uh, share your wisdom, please. Um, so uh, we have our uh, next biennial Food Hub conference. Um, we are in Atlanta this year. Uh, March 30th through April 1st will be the full conference, and uh, we'll have one or two pre-conference days. Um, one of the things that we will offer at the uh, at the conference, probably in one of these pre-conference days, is uh, a, a workshop that we develop called, we call Early Stage Food Hub Development Course. Uh, it's really a blitz through all the aspects of starting and running a food hub with a ton of additional resources provided on a thumb drive. But uh, you don't have to wait uh, until our conference for that. Uh, Southern SOGS conference in Lexington uh, is at the end of January, and we will be doing one of our workshops there. And there's also one in Durham, North Carolina on November 6th as part of the Carolina Farm Stewardship Conference. So contact me uh, if you would like information on how to be a part of either one of those trainings. Uh, and um, I wanted to mention our, our general mailing list. Um, there is a sign-up link on uh, wallacecenter.org website. Uh, you can uh, sign up for our food safety list. Um, uh, there's a, a, our National Good Food Network list. Um, we, uh, we have an approximately monthly newsletter. Uh, and if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, Group Gap, uh, ngfn.org slash food safety is the place for that, um, or wallacecenter.org slash food safety. Okay. And then, thank you, Jeff. And then uh, the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food initiative, uh, the website, uh, the one-stop shop for all financial technical assistance. You can go check it out there. One of the things I wanted to highlight is the compass map, um, which I'll get to in a second. But just to overwhelm you with a slide, oh, no, not yet. So there's where on you go to the website, you'll be able to uh, really be able to see all our grants, loans, support. Um, we try to use real plain English, not all the gobbledygook that we usually put on our on our website, so hopefully it's actually somewhat intelligible. These give you a general sense of a lot of different grant and loan programs. And then, um, you know, we really do offer support all along the supply chain. Uh, this is the slide I want to overwhelm you with, which is quite a bit. But it, uh, I put the slide up here for one purpose only, which is to say there's a lot of grant and loan programs that USDA have to offer to support local regional food systems development. Uh, this one I developed thanks to a lovely intern I had over the summer because I often think in terms of supply chain management, I decided to list the different grant and loan programs by where you may be within the supply chain, whether you're an aggregator, distributor, processor, producer, what have you. And then, of course, along the bottom, there's a lot of, of research, education, and technical assistance programs that we offer as well. And these can all be hyperlinked, so when you get this slide deck in PDF, you can go directly. Those hyperlink slides will take you right to the websites where you can find more information about those. Um, I also thought it's helpful sometimes to be thinking about USDA programs within uh, stages of business development. So this was my 
uh, attempt to kind of highlight a few of, I think, the more key uh, food hub, um, um, food hub more specific programs that can be helpful to you, whether in the planning stage, implementation, or in your growth stage of development. And I wanted to mention the compass map. Uh, we just recently updated the map, and it's a pretty remarkable endeavor, I have to say, which is essentially since 2009, we have listed on this map every single, maybe not every single, but almost every single USDA investment in local food uh, from 2009 through 2014. And we'll get 2015 up there once all the our grant and loan stuff uh, gets processed. Um, and we also have a number of contacts layers there in terms of farmers markets, food hubs, um, uh, slaughter facilities. Um, so it, it's a way for you to say in Indiana or even within your county in Indiana, say who's really doing what uh, in the food system space. And um, like I said here, you can explore different options and, and see, oh, here I am, and this is actually in the Appalachia area, uh, Shenandoah area, and, and looking at you know who who's getting investments from from USDA in what area, what grants. So there's opportunities for you to kind of even, you know, you might have been quite surprised, oh, within my county here in Indiana, I had no idea this this organization was doing this food hub related or, or even food system related work, and there might be opportunities for you to engage with them. And then even within our, our Compass Map, you can actually search something. So if you're specifically looking at, oh, I want to see what kind of USDA programs can fund cold storage, for example, you can literally type in cold storage and probably get a, a query of, 50 or 60 other or results of 50 or 60 other examples of cold storage type um, investments that USDA has made and, and see what kind of programs people are utilizing to, to, to uh, invest in that. And I know we, we ran through that quickly, but we, we thought we'd be done at 345 and it's 355, um, but we, we're happy to stay in the line uh, beyond four o'clock to answer any questions you have. And on behalf of Jeff Bartman and myself, uh, thank you for your for staying on the line. I think most people didn't jump off yet, so that's always good. Um, and we're happy to take your questions. We'll turn it over to Josh to facilitate that. Thank you, Jim and Jeff. That was uh, that was really good. Um, I'm pretty sure all of you can see the little red mute button next to your name in the participants list. If you have a question that you would like to um, uh, just unmute your mic, and and I'll ask ask away, or else uh, you can chat and send it to everyone, so everyone can see the question. Um, but I do have I do have a few questions of my own. Shoot. Well, I'll I'll start with one. Um, having uh, seen a, f a few groups that are in the planning stages of uh, of a food hub, have you noticed any common tipping points that move food hub groups from the planning stages to the building and implementation stages? Like a, yeah, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go? Well, you go. You go. Uh, I'll I'll respond to you. Uh, anything that sets up the tipping point, it moves you from the planning to the implementation. I think, I mean, there, there's a number of things. Obviously, financing is a big piece of that, which is, allows you to really uh, take whatever interest and enthusiasm is out there to, you know, go into the implementation piece of it. Um, but I think, you know, so that, that's an obvious answer, but I think also it's the commitment, um, both verbal and, and otherwise commitment from producers to say, yeah, we're, we're actually very interested in this, and let's let's make this happen. Um, not all the, all the financing in the world isn't going to get a producer to commit if they're not feeling comfortable that you as the food hub manager, as you as the food hub organization, uh, have not uh, developed that kind of trust and that kind of relationship with the producer community. And of course, the, the same goes for the buyer community as well, who is, expressing an interest in buying products. But I, I think it almost always starts on on the uh, supply side uh, with the case of food hubs, um, that mm -hmm. most successful food hubs have built up a cadre of committed, serious producers who see value in working with this food hub organization. Mm -hmm. And that takes time on both sides, right? It takes time to, to build the trust. Uh, from your from your supply, um, and um, you know it, it takes. 
uh, it takes time for your buyers to um, to basically buy enough that it, it is viable for you to deliver to them. Uh, I'm talking about wholesale here, but um, uh, and uh, this is this is that that ramp up period where. Um, or you, you, you need to feel uh, financially supported uh, to allow for allow for growth. I also wanted to um, bring up the the point uh, that I would I would like to sort of spread the world the the word around the nation that uh, it takes uh, just as much courage to decide yes I'm going to open this food hub as uh, often it does to decide you know what. This is not right, um, and uh, I there are other ways for me to have positive effects on my food, local food system without uh, starting a food hub. Um, something that uh, it doesn't have as uh, cool a name as food hubs, but um, uh, a value chain facilitator or value chain coordinator uh, is uh, a uh, a person or organization. Who um, makes makes good food happen? Uh, not uh, directly involved in the buying and selling and transportation uh, of the good food, like a food hub is. Uh, but uh, is that person that um, uh, uh, you know makes the connections between uh, between the supply and the buyers? Um, uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, it's almost analogous to that uh, person at the uh, at the party uh, who says, "Hey, you know, you you got you two should talk because uh, you're both interested in you know whatever it is." Um, uh, so that that role of connector, uh, value chain facilitator, value chain coordinator is an incredibly valuable valuable one, and in fact. Uh, it is is a low cost way to start to uh, build the relationships with the supply, build the relationships with the buyers, and if after doing value chain coordination for uh, a while, a couple of years, you realize there really isn't enough infrastructure, that might be a good time to to go and build a warehouse, buy some trucks, or or um, you will have the lay of the land, you have the relationships. Um, and it, it's like a an active feasibility study. You're 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 creating positive change while you're understanding the feasibility of creating a hub. So there was a question in the in the chat box. Uh, what if any roles have local food banks in your experience? Have they played? A role in planning and implementation with food hubs. Well, well, one example that uh, one of the processors in that Headwater Foods example is actually a, a food bank. Uh, they they have some they they are doing some uh, processing, uh, and Headwaters is intending to uh, leverage that processing. Um, there, there are several great examples of uh, food banks uh, getting into food hubbing, um, where they are uh, not not just having a, a focus on local donated food, but also uh, uh, buying and selling food um, locally. Uh, yeah, and just a couple of um, just a couple of examples of that. Um, there's a group called Harvested here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that is. Um, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Chattanooga Food Bank, um, and the way they decided structure was like you know some food some food banks are are literally um, brokering and, and buying and selling food on behalf of, of growers just like any food hub, and then others like this one have set up a subsidiary to do exactly that because they can see the interconnections and it just it ended up working out very well for them. And then we know examples we mentioned Common Market earlier when they first got started they worked with the food bank. Or a, or a hunger relief organization similar to that that um, had uh, storage capacity or underutilized storage that uh, come to market use. So they, their first storage and warehousing was was with that food bank, and similar situation with another food hub called Green Market Co. in New York City. Um, food banks could make fantastic partners specifically because of the uh, investment they've already made in, in you know, trucks and warehouses. 
So it's it's certainly something to to consider as an as an early partner as you maybe ramp up your food hub operations. Or may you may even see like you know as Jeff said, well maybe we don't need a food hub. Maybe there's a role the food bank can play that would be very similar to a food hub in this community that would really meet the needs of producers and meet the needs of consumers. Uh, kind of similarly along those lines, do you know of um, other models where an institution like a food hub, but uh, perhaps a, a hospital or a school, has uh, set up its own food hub in order to facilitate uh, local procurement? Well, uh, uh, I, I want to bring up a, a technicality, which is, <laughs> which is that. Um, uh, a hub uh, has to have um, m multiple uh, suppliers uh, as well as uh, multiple buyers. So, um, so if, if for instance, uh, a hospital and and several have uh, arrange uh, relationships with uh, a handful or even several local growers to. Uh, make deliveries and don't intend to sell sell it out. That's not technically a, a food hub. Um, uh, so so there is there's a great example of that up in Vermont. Although I I can't Jim, you remember the name of that hospital in Vermont? Uh, not off the top of my head. No. Right. It, it, it's it's the largest ho hospital in Vermont, and they they are they are procuring um, significant quantities of of local healthful food. Um, uh, I can't think of a uh, of an institution that took on full hubbing. There's there's a lot of this was there was a lot of consideration of this, and it may come to fruition. Although I don't think it has happened yet in Denver, the Denver, Denver school district. There, um, there was a nonprofit that was working with the school district. They, were, they had a really good procure, local food procurement program. And they had, because they had centralized kitchen and processing um, facilities that were servicing, you know, kind of all of the, the different schools in the district, there was a lot of discussion, like, well, we don't need to just be, we've got all this this, uh, this capacity here. Uh, you know, we could be actually develop a hub that would not just service our school district, but service other uh, institutions as well as even, you know, grocery, restaurant, the whole gamut. I don't think they've gotten there yet. I think they're still, they, they have a robust procurement program in which they're doing a lot of this. But that hasn't necessarily, they haven't taken that next step to selling into other markets and other buyers, which would ultimately classify them as a food hub. Um, there are, There is one example uh, with Fifth Season Cooperative, slightly different than what you might be thinking of, but an interesting uh, case study all the same. Fifth Season Cooperative uh, is a multi-stakeholder cooperative, so they have both producers they have processors, they have distributors, and they have buyers that are all part of the same cooperative. And the, the buyers are school districts. The distributors is, I believe it's Reinhardt um, distributor. Um, and so they, there's, th that's an example of where oh, part of ownership of this food hub is actually you know, the, the institution itself, as well as distributors and the producers. One item I wanted to bring up when um, Jim was talking about uh, deciding how much um, of the sale the food hub retains and how much goes back to the supplier, um, th there there are a, a wide variety of food hub models, um, and uh, some provide more uh, more services for the growers, others provide fewer services to the growers. So uh, uh, one uh, notable sort of low uh, zero infrastructure model uh, is uh, Red Tomato um, in Massachusetts. Um, they uh, are uh, they are full, full food hub. They do uh, they actively manage the uh, aggregation, distribution, and marketing of the the food. But they own no warehouse. They own no trucks. Um, they they manage the logistics. So uh, all all of their growers uh, have have uh, are of significant size and uh, have their own infrastructure or arrange their infrastructure. Um, uh, and uh, they give a very large percentage 
uh, of the the wholesale dollar back to the farm, um, but fewer services are are offered. Um, so somewhere in the middle uh, would be um, uh, maybe Farm Fresh Rhode Island, uh, who um, does not do aggregation, but they do do just distribution. Um, they and they do not, although they're just barely starting, but pretty much they don't do any uh, any marketing other than providing a, a, a common market online marketplace uh, for growers to list their own products. Um, so they're sort of in in the middle of how much they charge for overhead. Um, and then there are the more full service uh, food hubs that have trucks and warehouses like Cherry Capital Foods, uh, who then take sort of a more like a, a you know a, the sort of on the larger end because they're the growers are paying for more services. So uh, clever clever arrangement of businesses, uh, a business structure can uh, help determine uh, how much you can charge. I have a question about um, an existing uh, food hub who might be looking to, um, and I, th I think this is common among small businesses of when when to grow and jump into that next um, area of growth in terms of your customer base or your diversification of customers, and then um, um, deciding how that's going to happen and and what are what are some possible maybe specific resources or recommended resources that a food hub could use to sort of put themselves through those scenarios that you presented. I really like those scenarios. That was really interesting. And, and I'm wondering um, what a, an individual food hub might do to sort of do that for themselves. Well, we developed the, in the the scenarios and the financial viability modeling piece was specifically to, to help you with that question um, because it, it, it while, it, while it, it, it's certainly helpful for a food hub who's getting started to kind of look at the bottom line of what, what they may need to uh, generate in terms of sales to be operational break even, um, the modeling is actually a lot more helpful and useful for uh, food hubs in a growth period, thinking of, you know, uh, diversifying their product mix, diversifying their, their marketplace, and running kind of the numbers through that. Um, of course, that resource isn't available yet, <laughs> um, but it will be, and that would be one, one tool that I think will be helpful to food hubs um, thinking about that. Um, you know, in almost every situation, there's enough diversity in, 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 in within the food hub business structure and model to justify uh, investment in, in a consultant or someone who can do some financial analysis to, and, you know, expert who can say, okay, let's actually look at your specific business and let's sit down and let's run the numbers and see uh, what really makes sense. You know, and, and that, you know, we can, we can off, that, that cost can be offset. A perfect example is Headwater that we explained earlier in which um, they were look, they're in a kind of a growth period and they've been doing, a, a, have been very successful with direct consumer and they started to get into some wholesale and now they're thinking of processing um, and also just growing their wholesale market supply as well as making a pretty significant investment in, in, in warehousing and, and, and trucks in order to really take advantage of the wholesale marketplace. And so, you know, they got funds from USDA, Local Food Promotion Program, pretty easy to get a, um, a planning grant, $25,000 to run that type of scenarios. And that's what I would ultimately suggest, is that there are enough resources out there, whether at the federal, state, or local level, to do a good kind of feasibility or even growth study and, and see what makes sense for that specific hub. And if you are interested in hiring a consultant, uh, I, I think a great thing to do would be to come up with a, a semi-formal or semi-formal uh, request for proposals. Join the NGFN Food Hub Collaboration Community of Practice mailing list and post it there. And there are uh, several folks who are on that mailing list who uh, are highly capable cons consultants and could help you through that. 
Excellent. Thank you. All right. I think uh, there aren't any more questions. I think we'll call it time for now. And uh, just want to say thank you again to, to Jim and Jeff for, for their time and for putting on a presentation for us. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, our pleasure. And as Josh mentioned, he'll, we'll, um, he's got the, the slide deck and he can make it available to you all. And, um, you know, there are both Jeff and my contact information is on that deck. So if you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind you, two weeks from now, there will be, uh, at the bottom of the slide it says, a future webinar on how to choose a business structure. There is a fantastic guide uh, by Wholesome Wave uh, that goes through the pros and cons of uh, the various structures for profit, uh, well, even like limited liability, uh, uh, all the different uh, for-profit models, um, non-profit. Uh, uh, and then what we really want from all of the participants is some questions for our presenters because uh, the guide is such a good guide. Uh, we just want some um, some questions that will uh, that you have uh, that will drill down further into that guide um, and is more specific. Um, so far, well, I just want to thank you for your time, uh, even going uh, 15 minutes uh, past 4 o'clock. So, hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks. You too. Thanks. See ya. Bye.